Thank you for the intro, Ashley, and uh, good to see you back. Who is that weird guy? <laughs> so that's me. That's uh, 2014, not far from here. I was in the Chamber of Commerce, uh, not far from the White House, and I was giving a TEDx Fulbright talk. So that's five years ago, and uh, at that point, we just took our company basically out of Boston University to start initially commercializing our technology. So five years have gone by, artificial intelligence has advanced, leaps and bounds, and much has been said and written to inform, but most often disinform you about artificial intelligence. So I'm here to make the, the story a little bit clearer for everybody. So robots have advanced considerably, and uh, today you can see you know, YouTube videos of humanoid robots, snake robots, dinosaur robots, the not so useful perhaps, kangaroo robots, uh, and so forth. So this is great, and uh, many of these robots, I haven't seen them coming here to Fulbright uh, last night from Boston, so they're still not uh, widely available. But the real innovation, the real key for making this robot available is this, it's the human brain. And uh, many scientists across uh, decades, one of which I was me and my colleagues uh, at Boston University, we studied the brain and defined mathematically the operation of neurons and synapses, which are the basic element in our brain and how they interact with each other to give rise to what makes animals and, and uh, humans intelligent. So the ability to perceive, plan, think, execute tasks. So today we put this innovation in software because they're written as math and we can put it in computers and make them emulate aspects of behavior. So, this slide is awful, right? So it's a, uh, one of the projects that I was working on at Boston University with DARPA, but the, 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 the project itself is even more complicated than this slide. And let me give you an example of how artificial intelligence has become to fruition to everybody over the years. So DARPA is an agency that, uh, as you might know, has uh, uh, initiated small innovation like the internet, the GPS, and so forth. So in 2009, they hired me and my team at Boston University to help design brain-inspired chips which are very different than today's chips uh, or the chips that were designed uh, you know, starting from the 40s because they were brain inspired or their architecture was more similar to the brain than to, than to traditional uh, computers. And uh, any of you who has bought a cell phone in the past, uh, say, uh, 18 months has one of those chips inside your phone today. So beside the so-called CPU, which is the traditional central processing units of you know, computers and cell phones and GPU that renders the graphics, on the screen, today there are so-called NPUs or neural processing units. 10 years later, uh, after this innovation from DARPA, they are starting to make it into, uh, into everyday devices like the one you, you keep in your pocket. And in 2014, we were working with NASA, designing artificial brain to power completely autonomous robots like uh, uh, the type of Mars rover devices that are, are supposed to roam autonomously, designing synthetic brain or artificial brains that emulates for instance, the intelligence of a rat or a, or a, or a mouse that is able to navigate com uh, completely autonomously in an uncharted environment. So that was all good, right? So things look great, but that's what happened, right? And I call it the AI apocalypse. What's the AI apocalypse? Is the mix, uh, unholy mix between the concept of apocalypse and the concept of AI, right? So, and much of this is a consequence of these movies that have been uh, uh, projected on the screen uh, and manufactured in Hollywood over the many, many you know, decades, and some of which are beautiful, right? Who doesn't uh, remember the, the romantic feeling of uh, uh, Blade Runner and the, you know, the, the, the Matrix? And this, these are beautiful movies, but they're movies. They are stories. You shouldn't believe them, okay? <laughs> and uh, let me tell you the, a little bit about uh, our history as a, as a species in uh, uh, how we got scared about apocalypses. So the first I remember, I was back in Italy, and uh, somebody, somewhere somebody in the Bible wrote mille e non più mille, which is a thousand, but more, no more than a thousand, which means a thousand years will elapse after Christ, but no more. So everybody remembers how in a thousand, uh, a thousand years after Christ, the earth was devastated and we all burned, right? So let's zoom forward. This is a, a, a frame from a, a, one of the, my favorite show, uh, Mad Men. And uh, at a certain point in Mad Men, in 1969, they introduced the computer. You see that, like the fridge 
looking thing in the middle is the computer. And one of the characters in the movie, uh, the, the creative genius of the agency, that's, a, that's an ad agency, he goes crazy because they thought the computer was thinking, was talking to him, was spying, was going to take his job, right? And uh, I'm projecting on a computer right now, and billions of people use computer to study, to work, and to do all sorts of things. So we didn't die then? We obviously all die in 2000. You remember how we all died? So we all died in 2000 because apparently we couldn't figure out how to change the date from 1999 to 2000. So everything blew up <laughs> and I'm still itching, you know, I, I got hurt, but this is my favorite. <laughs> and let's pause here. 21st December 2012, who remembers that date? So it's my birthday. <laughs> so 2012, the Maya calendar, was supposed to stop, which is false. But we were all supposed to burn and die. The earth opened open up and you know, all sucked in. The problem was that my sister-in-law from, from Iowa, she's actually pretty impressionable, right? And uh, uh, that's my birthday. I was working with DARPA, doing AI, robotics. She thought I was the Antichrist. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to wait until the 22nd December of 2012 to talk to her again. And she said, okay, we're cool? Yeah, we're cool. <laughs> all right. Good. So these are... You know, I hope I entertain you with some, uh, uh, you know, stories, fantasies, and now let's talk about reality, right? So this is what my little tiny company, 50 people in Boston, did. Uh, we put AI in 45 million devices, all right? So that's real versus the fantasy that you listened before. So we are in uh, many, many millions of cell phones, and every time you take a picture with this brand of cell phone I cannot tell you about, but every time you take a picture, there is an artificial intelligence expert inside that simulates a professional photographer. So if you're not a professional photographer like I am, you can benefit from the expertise of a professional photographer inside the cell phone. In 50 milliseconds, you have this professional pro pho photographer that, that makes your image looking like great. Another application is in robotics. So we are in about 600 grocery stores, uh, stop and shop chain and the star market chain. There is this robot called Marty the Robot that goes around the aisles to understand various things. Some of the things that they, the robot does is uh, see if something fell on the ground, like a coffee spilled, and uh, alerts the personnel so they don't have to do that. They don't have to look for stuff falling down, and they can clean it before somebody gets hurt. So these are real applications uh, working in tandem with humans, right? So the human can do other things, such as customer service. Other applications, are these are some of my favorite, drones, right? So inspecting infrastructure. And we know how infrastructure are critical. If they collapse, they cause fires and so forth. But they're very dangerous and expensive to, to monitor. And so you launch a drone in the air with our AI inside. You can run it for you know, kilometers and miles and miles and miles, collect the data, understand if the infrastructure is healthy or it needs intervention. Another uh, application is in manufacturing. And uh, uh, you know, lo lots has been written, oh, bring back manufacturing jobs to US. Nobody wants those jobs. Nobody, nobody does. And the, the manufacturing company and the company that build the manufacturing machines, they want to put AI inside the machine so that the machine, the AI, artificial intelligence can do the job that nobody wants to do or nobody can because a product that comes out, a hundred you know, products per, per minute cannot be inspected by a human. We just don't have the stamina, the speed, or the desire to do so. So that's real AI, but I believe that in a sense, the feared AI apocalypse or the apocalypse has in a sense already happened. What do I mean by that? So in a typical life, in a typical day, we spend a lot of our time taking care of machines. We spend about 40,000 hours driving a machine, a car. We spend 40 times of 40% uh, of our day looking at the screen, if it's a computer, a cell phone, an iPad, and so forth. This contrasted with the amount of time we spend in exercising, which is less than 1%, or socializing, which is about 6%. So that's dramatic. And in a sense, my personal view of AI is the opposite of what we think. It's here to re-equilibrate so that we can keep our time and our brain for ourselves and have machine with their own brain do the task completely autonomously or much more autonomously than, than today. And the goal is very simple. The jobs of the future will have much less of these, which are staring at the screen, doing repetitive jobs, dangerous jobs, or just you know, yawning in front of a computer, and more of these, working 
in collaboration with machines, and machine taking over part of the repetitive job, doing more creative jobs, more thinking jobs, like use our brain for really what is what's designed for, which is to think things that robots can think today. And perhaps also socializing, right? If I have more time during the day, I can spend more time with my children or with the people I love. So I think, speaking of children, that our children, we look at the machines without artificial intelligence, the same way we look at technology that has been discontinued, right? So if you go to a farmer today, if you go to Iowa and you tell the Iowa farmer, hey, you can use your, your tractor, you have to go back to the plow, you have to run, right? They're gonna come after you. Nobody in their own mind, you know, in, the, in their same mind, will give up the computer to go back to their typewriter, unless they're romantic. And uh, nobody will also give up their car for a chariot. The same thing kids will do for us. They, they will not give up their technology. They will want machines to have their AI. So this is the last slide I gave in 2014, and that's actually still very present. And paraphrasing Fulbright, our future is not in AI, but in our own minds and hearts. So AI is here to help us. It's up to us to design in the proper way so it can help us in the right way. Thank you.